Good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you all to uh, a follow up in our series of neurology lectures, which is take, taken by the neurology department. Uh, today, I have the privilege and honor to introduce uh, one of our neurology consultants, Dr. Arun Matemani. Uh, sir, sir is an associate professor in neurology. Uh, he was also, I had the honor of being one of my teachers, and I was going to the posting. And uh, today, he's going to teach us about an approach to muscle disease. Uh, over to you, sir. Thanks, Thanks Rohan. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, head of uh, head of uh, medicine, Dr. Tambu, and head of neurology, Dr. Sanjit, for giving me this opportunity. So today, uh, today we will our session is approach to muscle diseases. So we will be dealing with this. So first, we will see what are the goals of of approaching when we see a patient with a suspected myopathy. And then we will be coming to, there are 10 patterns of muscle diseases. So we will go through each pattern and see some case scenarios. Right, so let's get started. So the first goal in when we see a patient with suspected uh, myopathy, muscle disease is to differentiate it from other diseases of the lower motor neuron. So you would have had lectures on uh, motor neuron disease and you will have a lecture, you had lecture on neuropathies. So initial step, so the first goal in a patient with a suspected muscle disease is to determine the correct site of localization. And this can be distinguished by this by the characteristic uh, clinical and uh, clinical and laboratory features. So the next step, uh, once we identify the localization of muscle, next step is to identify where the where the exactly the defect is, whether it is a defect in the muscle channel. Uh, is it a defect in muscle structure or is it a defect in muscle metabolism? This is a cartoon showing the structural proteins involved uh, uh, in the muscle. Uh, you can see the uh, actin, myosin, uh, then the various proteins. So, uh, muscle, the muscle uh, disorder, disorders of muscle structure are known by various defects in the proteins. So, you can have uh, dystrophin protein. So, defect will be known as dystrophinopathies. You can have uh, dysperlin protein defect will be known as dysperlin dysperlinopathies and so on. So second goal uh, is to determine the co cause of the myopathy. So causes can be various hereditary disorders like uh, myotonic muscular dystrophies, myotonias, or is it an acquired neuropathy, ac acquired uh, myopathy like inflammatory, toxic myopathies, etc. Now the final third goal is to determine whether a specific treatment is available. Uh, most of the, uh, you know, apart from inflammatory myopathies, most uh, most uh, will not have a specific treatment. So, uh, if, we can't, if we are not able to uh, offer a specific treatment, then we have to strive to optimally manage the patient's symptoms so as to maximize his or her functional ab abilities to enhance the quality of life. So, this will require a multidisciplinary approach. So, we have a neuromuscular clinic here with a multiple multidisciplinary. Uh, neurology, PMR, and genetic uh, genetics. So, like, so coming to clinical evaluation. So, the most this is the uh, proper clinical approach. So, most most important element is to obtain a thorough history. So, after history, we should have a preliminary determination of the cause of my. Then we have to move on to physical examination. In particular, the distribution of weakness, which should provide additional information in determining the correct diagnosis. Then the last will be the laboratory studies, blood test, EMG, uh, muscle MRI, neuromuscular ultrasound, uh, genetic studies. They play a confirmatory diagnostic role. So coming to history. So in the history of uh, history taking in muscle diseases, we have basically six key, six key, key questions to ask. So first question is, which negative and or positive symptoms does the patient demonstrate? So, in a case of uh, my uh, muscle disorders, muscle disorders as such can present with uh, negative uh, negative symptoms or positive symptoms. Negative symptoms are weakness, fatigue, or exercise intolerance, atrophy, and they can also present with positive symptoms like myalgia, cramp, contracture, myotonia, and myoglobinuria. So, we have to in each case we have to ask for these things. So weakness is the most common negative symptom. So uh, this is the most uh, prominent symptom as well to with, with which patients come to us. 
So uh, proximal muscle weakness is the most common type in a, uh, in a myopathic disorder. So patient may give, if, if the lower limb proximal muscles are involved, the patient may give history of difficulty in climbing stairs, difficulty arising from low chair or toilet or getting up from spotted position. If the upper extremities are involved, then they might say difficulty lifting objects above head, brushing hair, etc. So rarely uh, patients can present with uh, distal muscle weakness also. So in that case, they may present with difficulty opening jars, difficulty in turning a key or tripping due to foot drop. Now, once we have the weakness, uh, we should see, we should ask uh, whether the onset was symmetric or asymmetric. Well, most of the uh, muscle disorders are uh, symmetric. Very rare, there are very cause, rare, rare uh, causes which can cause an asymmetric uh, weakness like uh, FSHD and inclusion body myositis. We'll come to that. Also, patients can uh, present with uh, focal, mus focal muscle weakness like bulb focal bulbar weakness. Patient can present with isolated dysarthria, dysphagia. They can present with uh, extraocular movements like uh, ptosis. Then, then very rarely the patients can present with isolated diaphragmatic weakness alone. So that is the negative uh, uh, symptom of uh, weakness. Other negative symptoms like fatigue and exercise. Fatigue is very non-specific, so we can't re re really rely on that. Then exercise intolerance is a symptom which we see in metabolic and my um, metabolic myopathy, especially metabolic and mitochondrial myopathy. Right. So coming to the positive symptoms which we have to ask, uh, we have to ask about uh, myalgia, cramps, and contracture. So myalgia again is non-specific. It can be episodic in metabolic uh, myopathies, or it can be constant, constant muscle pain in inflammatory myopathies. Also, we can ask for uh, muscle cramp. So cramp is a specific type of pain which can last from seconds to minutes and is usually localized to the muscle, uh, to the uh, calves. Also, there is a, uh, there's a specific type of uh, pain called muscle contracture, transient uh, no, contracture, which is very uncommon, which is, can, be, can resemble a cramp which is provoked by exercises. And this contracture is most commonly seen in metabolic myopathy, especially the uh, glycolytic enzyme defects. Right. So this is the table uh, which just uh, enumerates common disorders which present with uh, myalgias. So commonly what we see is uh, toxic uh, myopathies, especially statins. Then we can have inflammatory myopathies. And uh, disorders which uh, present with muscle contracture are uh, disorders with uh, metabolic myopathies, especially the glycolytic enzyme defects. Right. So another uh, another uh, uh, specific uh, feature of muscle disease is myotonia. So myotonia is caused by basically it is impaired relaxation of muscles after a forceful voluntary contraction, and it is caused by repetitive depolarization of the muscle membrane. So it commonly affects the eyelids and hands. So patients may present with uh, muscle stiffness or tightness. Example: they will they have difficulty in releasing their hand, hand grip after they shake hands or difficulty in unscrewing a bottle top or difficulty in opening opening their eyelids if they forcefully shut their eyes. So this is a specific symptom which we should try and elicit, which points to a muscle localization. So various factors can trigger myotonia, can like cold, fasting, potassium rich food. And classically, this myotonia symptom improves with repeated exercise. However, uh, if it worsens with repeated exercises, it's called paramyotone or paradoxic myotone. Right. So uh, this is a picture of a patient with an eyelid myotonia. He is forcibly closed his eyes and he has difficulty in opening, opening after that. Tongue myotonia and finger myotonia. After uh, finger grip, the patient has difficulty in opening, opening his fist. So um, myotonic uh, disorders with myotonia can be uh, dystrophic myotonias or non-dystrophic myotonias. Dystrophic myotonias uh, will have associated muscle weakness, especially myotonic dystrophy. Non-dystrophic myotonias is what uh, what we have, what is common myotonia congenita chloride channel defects. 
paramyotonia due to sodium channel defects etc so another another symptom which uh, we have to ask is myoglobinuria so in a patient with uh, any patient with this exercise uh, induced weakness and myalgia so we should ask if their urine has ever turned color color or red after these episodes so uh, recurrent episodes so a single episode uh, single episode may be may may be seen after any prolonged or intensive exercises so if patients have recurrent episodes of myoglobinuria it is a pointer to an underlying metabolic myoglobin so metabolic like uh, glycogen storage or lipid storage right so uh, second question uh, so uh, among the six questions the second question we have to ask is what is the temporal evolution so at what age did the problem began so the we have a different uh, set of uh, causes so based on age of onset some disorders some uh, if, if the myopathy starts at birth we can think of you know congenital myopathies congenital muscular dystrophies uh, myopathies presenting in childhood uh, the separate causes most common will be your uh, duchenne muscular dystrophy myopathy is presenting in adulthood will have a separate separate set of differentials so age of onset is uh, very important to elicit now how did the how did what is the duration and evolution so some myopathies have constant weakness like inflammatory myopathies muscular dystrophies some uh, some myopathies will have only episodic episodic periods of weakness with a normal strength interactively like metabolic myopathies and periodic paralysis so that we should uh, elicit and also we should see if if the patient has a constant weakness we should ask what is the tempo tempo of the disorder so whether it came acute or subacutely like in inflammatory myopathies or toxic myopathies or is it a chronic slow progression over years as we see in most muscular dystrophies or is it a non progressive weakness with little change over decades like we see in congenital myopathies so both constant and episodic uh, can have uh, muscle disorders can have monophase symptoms which are monophasic or a relapsing so patients with uh, periodic paralysis and uh, metabolic myopathies we classically see they have recurrent attacks of weakness over many years so the third question that we have to ask is is there a family history family history of a myopathic disorder so for that we have to have a detailed family tree three generations that we have to make so we have to look is there any any other involved family member and if it is there then we have to see whether it is dominant recessive or an x linked pattern we should ask for consanguinity or a direct question like uh, does anybody in the family have uh, muscle disease may not uh, sometimes yield so we have to ask whether any family members use canes wheelchairs do they have any skeletal deformities or do they have any functional limitations so these kind of questions may be more you uh, know may need more information no Uh, the next question we have to ask is are there any precipitating factors that trigger the episodic weakness or myotonia right so this uh, so various triggers can be there so some drugs there are drugs which can precipitate uh, muscle weakness like statins so if we see that uh, exercise is precipitating weakness is it during or immediately after exercise there is a clue clue for a metabolic myopathy especially the glycolytic pathway defect if the weakness comes after prolonged exercise then we have to think of a fatty acid defect and if it comes after exercise followed by a period of rest or after a high carbohydrate meal then we can think of a periodic paralysis if fever is uh, precipitating uh, weakness so we can think of uh, fatty again fatty acid uh, a defects like uh, carb carnitine palmitate oil transferase and if cold is cold exposure is precipitating weakness we can think of a myotonia right so this is the table showing various drugs and toxins which can precipitate a muscle disease 
Now, the first, fifth question we have to ask is, are there any associated systemic symptoms or signs? So, muscle disorders commonly are associated with uh, cardiac, cardiac, uh, cardiac dysfunction. That we have to ask, is there any features of cardiac illness? Some myopathies, as we said, some, some disorders can uh, present with uh, diaphragm involvement. So, they can present with respiratory failure as the first symptom like in pompous disease or acid maltase deficiency. Right. Also, some, uh, some myopathies, especially the metabolic myopathies, can have hepatomegaly. So, we have to look at this. So, cardiac, uh, so cardiac uh, symptoms can be in the form of arrhythmias, like in channelopathies like anderson Tavel syndrome, Kane-Syre syndrome. And some can present with congestive, congestive heart failure, like acid maltase deficiency, carnitin deficiency. Various muscular dystrophies like Duchenne dystrophy, Becker dystrophy, etc. And as discussed, some myopathies can present with respiratory uh, insufficiency, while like uh, pompous disease, while respiratory insufficiency can develop during the course of most uh, muscle muscular dystrophies. Right. So. Uh, so this is the history. So we have to ask the key, key questions. Then examination. So examination is also important. So, so we have to have a good general examination. So we have to look for cataracts or any frontal balding, which can be seen in myotonic dystrophy. Whether any dysmorphic, dysmorphic, dysmorphic features are there, like in congenital myopathies. Is the patient having any rash? As in dermatomyositis, you might be familiar with the rash, rash in various rashes in various inflammatory myopathies. Then, is there any evidence of any diffuse systemic uh, disease like amyloid, sarcoid, etc.? So, this is uh, the first picture is a patient with uh, frontal balding and uh, and little bit of ptosis. So, this is a classic uh, picture what you see in myotonic dystrophy. And the second picture, what you see is the typical facial appearance in a condition called anderson tavel syndrome. They have low set ears and a small chin. Also, we have to look at contracture. So, muscle disorders, uh, because of the uh, differential weakness in the muscle groups, they tend to develop uh, contractures. All muscle disorders, most of the muscular mus muscle disorders tend to develop contractures late. However, uh, there are some, uh, some conditions where you can get early contractures. So, early contractures at ankle can be seen in calpane. At elbow and ankles can be seen in a, a calpanopathies. So, contractures at the intervertebral joints can be seen in laminopathies, which can lead to a rigid spine. And contractures involving the proximal and distal joints out of proportion to weakness can be seen in collagenopathies like the Bethlehem myopathy. So we have to look for contractures, especially elbow contractures and ankle contractures. Then what we have to, we can come to the proper uh, muscle examination. So muscle examination, we can start with inspection, palpation, and then the uh, muscle strength examination. So while inspecting and palpating, we can see, we, can, we should look for, is there any evidence of atrophy or hypertrophy? Now, atrophy in most common uh, chronic myopathies, you can get some atrophy. Now, if we see hypertrophy, true hypertrophy, uh, this is seen in few conditions like uh, myotonia congenita, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, etc. And more common is pseudo hypertrophy, where the muscle bulk will be big, but the muscle will be weak. This is called pseudo hypertrophy. And this we see in commonly in Duchenne or Becker dystrophy. Now, uh, an important pointer is selectivity of muscle, muscle involvement. So selective, uh, what we say, selective, selective muscle involvement. So uh, it is characteristic of uh, genetic, genetic muscle disorders or muscular dystrophies. So they tend to weaken certain muscle groups but leave the other groups unaffected. Also, they may involve in a, even in a single muscle, it involve a part of the muscle while leaving the other part not involved. So that is hypertrophy and atrophy within the same muscle. So this is called selectivity. So we have to actively look at 
selectivity of muscle muscle involvement so this is this is a pointer to the genetic nature of myopathy so this selectivity is uh, it it becomes prominent it, it, it various signs are clinical signs are there uh, so first picture what you see is uh, something called valley sign valley sign is seen in dmd so you see a hypertrophic infraspinatus and uh, the posterior fibers or deltoid are atrophied so the selectivity of muscle involvement so valley sign is seen in duchenne muscular dystrophy in the second picture you see you have to use a little imagination so this is called calf heads on trophy sign so calf head on trophy sign is seen in dispersal uh, dispersal neuropathy now scapular winging so we have to elicit this sign in suspected uh, muscle disorders so scapular winging what is seen in commonly in many disorders but commonly is seen in uh, facio scapular humeral dystrophy we can have uh, anterior axillary fold wasting in various uh, myopathies so uh, we can have uh, popeye arms that is uh, uh, popeye arms is seen in uh, facio again in uh, facio scapular humeral dystrophy biceps lump that is part of the muscle is in the muscle bi biceps muscle is atrophic while part is hypertrophic so this is called biceps lump which is seen in dysphalenopathy polyhill sign polyhill sign you can see different you know, mounts of hypertrophic and atrophic uh, muscles this is seen again seen in facio scapular humeral dystrophy and the next one is diamond on quadriceps that in the, inside the quadriceps muscle itself some part is atrophied some is hypertrophied this is seen in dysphalenopathy calf hypertrophy is seen in uh, duchenne muscular dystrophy and again wasting of calf can be seen in this one so so this inspection palp inspection palpation and muscle examination can give you clues clues to the clues to the etiology so after uh, after the muscle examination so we can uh, we can attempt to classify myopathic disorders into 10 10 distinctive patterns of muscle weakness so each pattern will have a specific set of differentials and final diagnosis then then can be confirmed based on selective laboratory evaluation right so the after examination so most common pattern we find is the proximal limb girdle weakness so this is the most common pattern of muscle involvement so we see symmetric weakness affecting predominantly the proximal muscles of legs and the arms or this is also known as the limb girdle distribution distal muscles are usually involved but to a very lesser extent and uh, can have neck extensor and flexor muscles involvement also so this is the pattern proximal limb girdle weakness this is the pattern which we commonly at you know is synonymous with a myopathy this is what we see in most hereditary and acquired myopathies so we'll see some case uh, case scenarios also so let's look at case one so five year old boy was brought by his mother to his pediatrician because of running difficulties the mother noted that the boy was a product of normal pregnancy but was not able to walk until 16 months of age so there is a motor delay he is walking was late also she noticed that the the boy also had prominent calves and so also she volunteered history of her brother who had similar calves and had died at the age of 12 with heart complications so five year old boy with a motor delay with prominent calves and a family history of brother with similar calves and who died at the age of 12 with heart complications so examination patient's vitals for some hypertension was there and examination revealed a proximal weakness of both upper and lower extremities or a limb girdle pattern weakness there was calf calf hypertrophy normal sensations gover sign was positive and creatinine kinase done was around 10000 so what's the diagnosis we are seeing this is a patient with a classic presentation of duchenne muscular dystrophy early onset motor delay and calf hypertrophy so whenever uh, 
as uh, you know, adult physicians, we may not be, you know, some of you may be you know, seeing it in peripheral places. So whenever you see high creatinine kinase, motor delay and calf hypertrophy, so we should uh, suspect a DMD, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So let's see another case. A 24-year-old man gave a three-year history of progressive difficulty in raising both arms above shoulder. Something he first noticed at the right side while playing cricket. Lower limb weakness also followed, resulting in walking and climbing difficulties. On examination, there was scapular winging, weakness of uh, shoulder, again, a proximal limb girdle weakness. There was an exaggerated lumbar lordosis and viscerotosis. Viscerotosis is uh, uh, the abdominal muscle being weak and the viscera coming. So CK was around uh, 4,000. What's the diagnosis? So this is a patient with a calpanopathy, uh, proximal limb girdle weakness, exaggerated lumbar low doses, viscerotosis. So we have to suspect calpanopathy. Let's see another case. 21-year-old woman, young woman, presented with weakness. Her motor development was normal as a child. In primary school, she was actually faster and stronger than other children. And also at 15 years of age, she noticed that when she ran, she just could not go. And over the ensuring six years, her leg weakness slowly progressed. Now, since the last 16 years, she recalls she could not stand on her tiptoes. So difficulty in, uh, that will be difficulty in uh, weakness of her uh, uh, gastronemus. So could not stand on her tiptoes. Her arms remain strong. There is no ocular bulbar, respiratory or cardiac symptoms. She never had history of cramps or episodes of dark view. On examination, she had diminished calf bulk, but no facial weakness or scapular weakening. In a lower limb examination, the power was hip flexors, hip, hip extensors, hip abductors, adductors were 4 plus, knee extensors were 4 minus, and there was a diamond on quadriceps sign on the knee extensors, that is quadriceps. Ankle flexors, sorry, knee flexors, four plus, dorsal flexors, five. And ankle plantar flexors was slightly weak. So uh, we have seen previously this kind of uh, proximal uh, limb girdle, especially here, the lower limb is more involved. And she has a diamond on quadriceps uh, sign. So this is a case of dispar limb. So the, the common uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy is what that we see clinically are calpanopathy, dysphalinopathy, sarcoglycanopathy, and anactaminopathy. Right. So let's see the second pattern. So the most common pattern is the uh, proximal limb girdle. So uh, some myopathies can present with distal weakness. So, uh, so of course, we have to distinguish it from peripheral neuropathies because distal weakness is not a common common presentation of myopathy. So predominantly involves the distal muscles of upper or lower extremities. The lower extremities can involve the anterior or the posterior compartment. Involvement is usually, although not invariably, symmetric. Now, so what are the myopathies which present with distal weakness? So there's an entire distal, uh, no, distal group, uh, distal myopathy sub, subgroup. In a Wielander, Nonaka, Miyoshi, Right. So, if the patient has an anterior uh, you know, anterior weakness, that is tibialis anterior weakness, they can present with foot drop, especially myotilinopathy, desmin. So, uh, how can we distinguish this pattern from a peripheral neuropathy? So, even though their uh, ankle dorsiflexion, the tibialis anterior is weak, the toe extensors will be preserved, that there will be sparing of toe extensors. And we can also see hypertrophy of extensor, the muscle called uh, muscle on the foot called extensor digitorum brevis. So this is the uh, pointers to a muscle disease. So there can be weakness of the posterior compartment, gastronemia soleus, especially dysphoria. And some, some distal myopathies can have weakness of both the anterior and posterior compartments. Right. So let's see a case. A 25-year-old young man presented with progressive bilateral foot drop for the past five years. 
So he is also so distal weakness, both legs, five years. He is also having hand weakness for the past six months. So on examination, what you find is bilateral the tibialis. They have uh, bilateral tibialis anterior muscles are wasted, and uh, first diff, first dorsal interosseum is also wasted, and lower extremities. This is what we find: hip flexors, hip extensors, hip abductors, adductors. Four plus this mild weakness will be there. Knee extensions are fully preserved. Knee extensions that is quadricep is fully spared. Five percent, uh, five. And while uh, knee flexors are weak, weakness predominant weakness of ankle dorsiflexors, grade two power, and plantar flexors, grade uh, four plus power. And CPK will be around six hundred. So this is a common distal myopathy. What we see clinically, it's called a nonaka myopathy. Uh, it has different names. GNE myopathy. It's the current name. Previously, it was known as nonaka myopathy or Heard HIV, hereditary inclusion body myopathy. Right. So the third pattern that we see in muscle disorders is what called as scapuloperoneal pattern. Patients can have proximal arm and distal leg weakness. So this pattern affects the periscapular muscles of the proximal arm and the anterior compartment muscles of the distal lower leg. So scapular muscles of the upper limb and Anterior compartment of the distal uh, of the lower limb. So scapular muscle involvement usually we see as scapular winging, and this can be very asymmetric. One side can be more involved. So when we see this pattern, that is a scapuloperoneal pattern with facial weakness, it is suggestive of a disorder called facio-scapulohumeral dystrophy. So other disorders in this pattern, most common is uh, facio-scapulohumeral dystrophy. Other common disorders, even acid uh, pompous disease, can present emery roof dystrophy. Calpain also can have this pattern. So let's see a case: a 35-year-old man who worked as a construction worker presented for evaluation because he had been catching his toe and falling multiple times at work. That is, he is having foot drop. So he is catching his toe because of the foot drop and is falling multiple times. He stated that he he has trouble lifting his left foot at the, his ankle, and while he was not sure when it first started, he felt it progressed fairly rapidly. He also stated that despite his work in construction, he has never been able to lift his arm right arm above his head. So there is some weakness of the periscapular muscles, and he has not been able to whistle. There is some weakness of the facial muscle. That no one in his family has a similar disorder. on examination he could not bury his lashes on post dye closure he had a flattened pucker and there is a scapular winging more on the right side and he has difficulty in abducting arms above 80 degrees and we see a beaver sign positive beaver sign and there is weakness of tibialis anterior which is greater on the left than the right and cpk is around 500 so what is the diagnosis so this is uh, uh, so this is a classical finding in uh, muscular dystrophy called facio scapulohumeral dystrophy facial muscle is involved periscapular muscle is involved distal leg muscles are involved and we can some most of them also have abdominal muscle we can have a positive beaver sign also. right so the next pattern is the distal arm and proximal leg weakness so distal arm weakness involving the distal forearm that is wrist and finger flexors and proximal leg weakness involving the knee extensions this is mainly the quadriceps so this uh, in this pattern facial muscles are usually spared so when when we see this pattern distal arm and proximal leg and again this pattern is synonymous with inclusion body myositis so let's see a case a 67 year old man presented with a one year history of progressive weakness of left hand grip and six month weakness of right hand grip and neurological examination there is mild weakness of bilateral elbow flexors wrist flex wrist flexors left for the right there is focal patchy weakness of finger flexors especially deep finger flexors ranging from moderate to severe 
and there is mild weakness of hip flexors and knee extensors and moderate weakness of ankle dorsiflexors. So, so this pattern is classically seen in uh, inclusion body muscles. Right. So, coming to uh, uncommon patterns, we'll quickly go through this. So, uh, some muscle disorders can present with ptosis with or without ophthalmoparesis. So, ptosis without ophthalmoparesis, congenital myopathies. Ptosis with ophthalmoparesis will have a separate uh, differential. Most common is uh, oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. So again, this is a rare pattern, muscle disorders with prominent neck extensor weakness. Rare pattern. The next pattern is uh, bulbar weakness. So mus muscle disorders with prominent bulbar weakness. What we see clinically is inflammatory myopathies. They of course will have limb girdle pattern. Along with that, they will have a prominent uh, bulbar weakness. The muscular dystrophies which have a prominent bulbar weakness is uh, oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. And uh, as far as uh, inflammatory myopathies are concerned, all of you will be well versed. The you know, various muscles, myositis specific antibodies in dermatomyositis, synthetase syndrome, necrotizing myopathy, and the multisystem involvement and the treatment. So. Uh, only inflammatory myopathies, we can offer a definitive uh, treatment, steroids, steroid sparing agents. Right. So, uh, uh, there are a couple more patterns. So, episodic, uh, this, this pattern will be episodic pain, weakness and myoglo myoglobinuria related to exercise. So, exercise exercise precipitating weakness, pain, and myoglobinuria. So when we have this pattern, we have to think of metabolic myopathies, glycogen storage or lipid storage. So metabolic myopathies which present in adulthood can be glycogen storage, pompous disorder, fatty acid oxidation defects like carnitin, palmitoyl oil transferase deficiency, mitochondrial disorders. So these are the key points which uh, point to a metabolic myopathy, rhabdom, myoglobinuria, exercise intolerance, fatigue, symptoms arising after a period of fasting, prominent myalgia cramps. You can have uh, transient contractures or fixed contractures. Right. So symptoms are precipitated by short bursts of high intensity exertion then we should consider glycogen storage disorders. And some, some of these may have a second wind. That is, there will be resolution of pain and regaining of muscle strength after resting for around 10 minutes, at which point further ex exertion can take place without symptoms. So second wind phenomenon is typically seen in McAdle's disease. While symptoms which are preceded by prolonged periods of low intensity exercise is typical of uh, fatty acid oxidation disorders, also mitochondrial myopathies. So short bursts, short exercises, high intensity exercise, precipitating symptom is glycogen storage. Prolonged uh, low intensity exercises, precipitating weaknesses, fatty acid oxidation defects, also mitochondrial myopathies. So let's see a case. A 25 year old male was referred to a neuromuscular service after presenting with type 2 respiratory failure. He had three months history of increased tiredness, drowsiness, and had been found to be hypoxic with marked hypercapnia with an elevated serum creatine kinase. On further questioning, he reported delayed motor milestones as a child and that he struggled with sports. He was initially thought to have polymyositis and treated with corticosteroids. So, he's, uh, so he presented with a type 2 failure and his respiratory state improved with a BiPAP. And on examination, he had marked paraspinal and scapular winging with hamstring and calf and anterior leg wasting. So what is the diagnosis? This is a patient with pompous, pompous disease. Uh, let's look at another case. A uh, woman aged 26 years was referred to a neuromuscular clinic after an episode of rhabdomyolysis, which was triggered by exercise with the 
initial serum CPK, creatinine kinase of 59,000. And she says that in retrospect, she has been having exercise induced myalgia and myoglobinuria for a few years, despite being very fit and active. And she says that her myalgia tends to happen 40 to 120 minutes into exercise and then would persist for days afterwards. And there is no second wind phenomenon. And examination was normal. So in this, we should suspect uh, fatty acid oxidation. So this is the cartoon showing the both, uh, both the glycolytic pathway and the fatty acid oxidation pathway. Right. So two more patterns we have to cover. So, so we have seen weakness, myalgia related to exercise. Now, weakness, which is delayed or unrelated to exercise, we see in various periodic paralysis. Calcium channelopathies, hypokalemic periodic paralysis, sodium channelopathies, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. So let's see a case. A 29-year-old man present to the emergency department following an attack of paralysis that occurred after a football game and drinking several beers with his friends. In the emergency department, his potassium was 1.3 and CPK level was in the thousands. And his history revealed that he had experienced other attacks during adolescence that had never been diagnosed because they had always been only partially limiting and always resolved spontaneously after several hours. He has since learned to avoid high, high carbohydrate meals and exercise to avoid recurrence of the episodes. On examination, his muscles appear to be of normal bulk tone and only the mild scapular wing. So ECG showed uh, features of hypokalemia, flattening of T waves and potassium level uh, improved after four, four hours after potassium supplementation. So this is classic of uh, period, hyper, hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Now the uh, last pattern that we have to, uh, we have to see, uh, we have to learn is this stiffness and decreased ability to relax or myotonias. So disorders which present with myotonias. So this pattern includes all disorders that produce myotonia and paramyotonia. And these are mainly channelopathies, basically hereditary disorders involving skeletal muscles, sodium and chloride channel, as well as the dystrophic myotonias, myotonic dystrophy type 1 and 2. Right. So non-dystrophic myotonias are the dystrophic myotonias. So let's see a case. A 27-year-old man presented with for evaluation of painful stiffness. And uh, he has always been considered muscular for as long as he could remember. And people had asked whether he went to the gym. So beginning in primary school, he had noticed trouble with spots, which required quick reflexes. When running races in the track, he would freeze when the starting gun would go off, even after warming up. If he overexerted himself, he would remain sore for the rest of the day. And uh, he says that his father also was always muscular despite never working out. So this is called Herculean appearance seen in myotonia congenita. So this is a case of myotonia congenita. And the, the patient noticed more pain with the stiffness as he grew older. And in high school, this symptom required him to alter his choice of sports and activities. He eventually sought treatment because he was no longer able to play any sports. Examination, he had normal strength but he had hand grip and percussion myotonia. So this is a typical case of a myotonia congenita, chloride channel myotonia. Let's see another case of myotonia. A 21-year-old woman presented for evaluation of stiffness. And she first noticed that the body would freeze up at eight years old when she sw swam in cold water. In addition, she noticed that in cold weather, she would become stiff and achy. And sometimes after sneezing, especially if sneezed more than once, she was unable to open her eyes. And her mother, aunt and first cousin all had stiffness and achiness when swimming in cold pools. On examination, she had mild symmetric proximal weakness, prominent myotonia, which worsens, which worsened with repetition. So this patient has paramyotonia. Uh, this is a uh, sodium channel my, uh, myopathy, paramyotonia congenital. Right. So we have covered the 
10 patterns of uh, muscle weakness. So after, after we make a pattern, then we have to investigate. So uh, the available uh, laboratory investigation in myopathy is creatinine kinase. Then we have EMG. We have neuromuscular uh, muscle MRI, neuromuscular ultrasound, muscle biopsy, and of course, genetic test. So these are the laboratory evaluations that we have for evaluation. So uh, creatinine kinase is elevated in most patients with muscle disorders. In slowly progressive myopathies, however, it can be normal. And the degree of uh, elevation can be helpful in distinguishing different types of muscular dystrophies. So if we see a CPK, CK level more than 10,000, then we have to, in an appropriate sitting, we have to suspect uh, this muscular dystrophy, dystrophin, calpain, dysphagia. However, we should be careful that CP can, can also be elevated in other disorders, can be elevated in motor neuron disorders, neuropathies, and uh, there are other factors also which, uh, which cause increase, like increased muscle mass, hypothyroidism, hypoparathyroidism, medications like statins, race, sex, etc. And IM injections can also cause increased CP. So that we have to keep in mind. Right. Then we have EMG. So, so while, while we put the needle, uh, whether we are getting abnormal you know, fibrillations or sharp waves, if we have this then clues to inflammatory myopathies, muscular dystrophies. In myotonia, if we get myotonic discharges, then it, it gives more clue. So what is a myotonic, uh, myotonic discharge? So it, it has a characteristic uh, sound. It's called dive bomber sound with a waxing and man. So this is the cartoon which shows the EMG, EMG appearance of a myotonia. Right. So biopsy, so final, final diagnosis may require muscle biopsy or a genetic, genetic study. So whenever, uh, so muscle biopsy, so we have to be careful when to do muscle biopsy. So selection of appropriate muscle to biopsy is critical. So muscles that are severely weak, that is MRC grade three or less should not be biopsy because the results are less likely, they are likely to show only end-stage muscle disease. In addition, muscles that have been recently, recently studied by needle EMG should be avoided because they will have artifacts created by needle insertion. So muscle biopsies should be taken from muscles which have at least grade four strength. So in upper, uh, upper extremities, so we have to, most uh, accessible muscles are biceps or deltoid. And in the lower extremities, best choice would be a uh, vastus lateralis, right? So that comes to the end of the lecture. Questions I can answer.